Is there a list of what the agenda stuff's going on? Uh, yes. Give me my copy, but I need it. Okay. I think Nicole went to grab some handouts. Yes. Anyway, we're going to do what we're going to right now. Hey, Joe. Yeah. Hi, hi, John. I see you there. How many of how many uh, commissioners do we have? It's just uh, Danielle, Eric, and myself. Well, I, don't, I don't know right. who's, who's online. People could have opted because of the weather to maybe go remote. There's no, there's no uh, council, there's no planning commission members online. John? Yeah. Let's give it like a five minute weather delay. It's already 6.30, yep. but like I said, it's, it's getting a little bit gnarly outside again. Is it snowing? Yeah, it started about maybe 40 minutes ago. All hey. right, so Silas just hopped on, so we do have four. Cool. Just us and the only one that I know that's online is uh, Silas right now. So I said I'll do a five-minute uh, weather delay just in case somebody else will drag on in, but we're, we're good to go.
shorts. First to go. Yeah, he's on the right side. Thank you. Caps are in order in this meeting. Yes, they are. <laughs> That time that he had the shortest commute to this place, and he said, it was, you, know, you know, I was thinking about doing the same thing, but I said, I'd just kick clean the car up, and uh, the roads aren't that bad. No, the roads aren't bad at all. How's your car doing? Because the cross track is great, and I don't even have the snow tires. Are you Terry? I am Terry Sapp. Hi, and I can tell who you are because <laughs> <laughs> you have a title. Hi, Terry. <laughs> Hello, Joe Fatizzi. Pleased to meet you. Say it again, Joe Fatizzi. Hi, Joe. I'm Terry Sapp. Hi. We're gonna. We, we have you definitely on the uh, agenda yes. for for yes. later on. Yes. And we're just giving it a couple minute uh, weather <laughs> delay before nice I open the uh, meeting up in just a couple of minutes. You are the chair of this. I, I am. Yes. <laughs> you carry an extra load. Yeah. No, I'm looking forward to Thursday. Hi. Right. Your name on the. Pleased to meet you. <laughs> there you are. Say your last name for me. Of Freiburger. Easy enough. Well, we we were kind of hoping, considering that there's three public hearings, yeah. but I think it's the snow. Definitely, well, I think it's the snow. Yeah. yeah, we might get a few people on line. We'll see. Oh, true, because that can be uh, citizens as mm -hmm. well as. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Snow. You made it through the snow. Yeah. All wheel drive. Yeah. No yes. Nicole, let me know when you're ready and then I'll no, get moving on this, okay? Yeah. Okay. Are we recording yet? Bill, are we recording? Yes, we are recording. Two hours of snow coming. So so ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm about ready to uh, open the meeting. <laughs> And at that point, would everybody stand for the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, meeting is opened at 6.36 p.m. on December 20th, 2022. Can people please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? The Pledge of Allegiance to, to the flag, flag, of, the flag United States, of the United America, States of America. To the Republic for which to the Republic. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So on to our roll call. Commissioner Freiberger. Present. Commissioner Johnson. Present. Commissioner Frenette. Absent. Commissioner Maddox. Uh, I'm here. Okay. Commissioner Maddox is present and online. Commissioner Fatizi. Present. Commissioner Huggins. Are you are you around? Absent. So with that, uh, can we move on to the first item on our agenda and that would be our approval of consent agenda items from the uh the, the november 15th 2022 meeting has everyone had the opportunity to uh take a look at it you meant the minutes from changes or updates that need to happen there there was just one on the uh, last sentence we have that the uh, next planning commission meeting scheduled for december 20th 2023 which is a really minor typo so that should just be december 2022 thanks joe yeah it's it's, it's minor no big deal, I can fix it. So at this time, would anyone like to make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of November 15, 2022? I so move. I have a first from Commissioner Freiberger. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Commissioner Johnson. Is there anything that anyone else would uh, like to discuss? If no. I will take a motion to approve. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No one. Motion carries. So we will move on now to our next item, which is our general public comment section of the uh, meeting. So with that, Bill, do we have anyone online uh, 
that uh, let me just read a little bit of a disclosure here. If anyone wishes to speak, please limit comments to three minutes or less. Comments may also be submitted via email or mail ahead of the hearing and read into the record. The instructions to submit comments are published prior to planning commission meetings on the monthly commission agenda. And if you would like to speak, please state your name, address, or any group that you uh, represent. So I will open up the general public comments meeting at portion, I'm sorry, at 639. And at this point, do we have any emails or mail that needs to be read into the record? Nope. Any audience members wishing to speak in the general public comments, which is different than what you folks are, are here for? Is that different than what's on here? Co correct, yes. They'll, they'll, you'll have that, that opportunity to go specifically to those items at that time. This is just if you have some general comment of really anything going on in the city or an action that would be in front of us, not on the current agenda. Is there anyone online that would like to make a general public comment? With that, I'm assuming the answer would be no, so I will now close the general public comment section at 6.40 p.m. On to our next item. Public hearing number one, as published, it's a possible amendment, I'm sorry, I need to pull up. Uh, possible amendments to create a new chapter in Title 17 SWMC to address state requirements for homeless encampments operated by religious organizations. And at this time, before I open anything up, John and Nicole, would you like to uh, start us off here? Yeah, I got, got this. So um, the Planning Commission heard uh, and reviewed proposed amendments to the Homeless Encampment Ordinance at its last meeting. Um, this, affects, <clears throat> uh, this affects homeless encampments at religious organizations, and it doesn't preclude the allowance of uh, homeless encampments, but it puts uh, bounds on uh, how they are operated and, and puts a requirement for a permit for a homeless encampment. And it, these regulations also have um, <coughs> regulations for safe Parking, which is different than homeless encampment, but uh, like uh, living in one's car at a religious institution's parking facility. So it also creates regulations for that, uh, although there is no permit process created for safe parking. These regulations are based on state requirements. Um, so we made sure that we were following the, the state requirements uh, for homeless encampments because the, um, there's several things that cities can't do, such as preclude them. Um, so we're creating rules that meet all the state requirements. I'd like to also point out that uh, after the planning commission's discussion, they had a couple of, com they had a couple of comments and, um, uh, our city attorney's office um, made the requested amendments. And again, Tara Kalar is here with, from our city attorney's office. And uh, Tara can answer any questions that you might have about the ordinance itself. And then we also reached out to all of the churches in the city limits that have um, that have property that I was aware of. And so I uh, emailed and or called the North Cascades Christian Fellowship, Central United Methodist Church, Bethlehem Lutheran Church, Inspire Church, First Baptist Church, and McElight Heart of Mary Catholic Church. I also uh, reached out to Family Promise and Helping Hands because they have, um, they also work with um, homeless populations and made sure everybody was aware of the hearing today as well as um, pointed them to 
where they could get information, uh, where there was, they could see the ordinance that uh, we're proposing. And I had some good conversations with um, some of those or people at those organizations and they appreciated us reaching out to them. Uh, I do not see anybody online that uh, is from any of those organizations, but um, they did have the opportunity and we discussed some uh, of the, the ordinance uh, on, by phone and I emailed them information. So since the Planning Commission did work on this in December, I'm not going to go over the details of the proposal. Uh, in the memo, I did mention um, the two places in the ordinance that uh, Tara made amendments to to address the Planning Commission's comments from the last meeting. So that's all I have to present. If, uh, if you have any questions for myself or Tara, uh, you can do that now or uh, you can wait until after opening the public hearing. Yeah, this, this was just a quick question. The organizations you reached out to, they were the ones that had the uh, minimum one acre, uh, what do you call it, size capacity to uh, handle uh, a facility like this. Is that correct? I just reached out to all the churches okay. with significant okay. property. Um, if I missed any, I apologize. I kind of did it mental mapping throughout the, the city to, to find all of the ones um, but churches that own like a, a storefront or a um, or lease space, those I, I mm -hmm. wasn't those I did not reach out to. I didn't have contact information. Okay. But I think I got everybody. Yeah, no, and you have a very good mental map, by the way. So I'm not even going to question that. So prior to opening up our public hearing number one, if you would like to speak, please state your name and address or any group or organization you represent. So I will now open public hearing number one at 6.46 p.m. So if there is any member in the audience that would like to comment, please stand forward and uh, just state your name, address, and any organization. Philip Murray, mailing address 101 West Woodworth. Yeah, I'm curious is if any of these churches are actually going to allow any homeless there to stay there. If they, they put in an application for it or anything, if not, it seems like you're just kind of spinning your wheels and putting a damper on everything before it even comes about. And, uh, hopefully someone will step up and help some of these people out there. Um, I noticed the uh, library was closed today, which is a heating place to warm up, and it wasn't there for people. Um, and it's not very nice out. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Do we have anyone else in the audience? I think the answer is no. Is there anyone online that would uh, like to make uh, any statements? Bill, how many people do we have online currently? I just see five. There are more than five people online. Okay. But um, some of them are uh, staff and some are um, planning commission members. Okay. I, I know we also have the ability to uh, testify or present something via phone. Is there anyone on our phone bank or how however you handle that side? Is anybody requesting from the phone side to uh, make any statements? Just just the uh, through Zoom. Okay. So at this particular point, I, let's just give it another minute in case somebody comes online. I think this topic is so important and the fact that all we had was one individual wanting to testify. Uh, I just want to give everybody the benefit of the doubt that we actually did wait and want to hear what people had to say before I close this particular public meeting and we move on to our own uh, internal well, discussions. Go ahead, I'm listening. Joe, while you're waiting, we could acknowledge, it looks like um, Pat 
Commissioner Pat Huggins oh, has yeah. joined on Zoom. Thanks, Pat. Yeah. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> You're here. I, uh, just yeah. shoveling driveway. <laughs> So when my digital clock hits 6.50, I'll, I'll close the meeting unless somebody in the next, like I said, 60 seconds would like to, to have a say. Eerily quiet. <laughs> Okay, I will close public hearing number one at 6.50 p.m. Now at this time, I'm going to open it up to my fellow planning commissioners for uh, further discussion. Commissioner Johnson, would you like to uh, open up? Uh, certainly. Um, I, mean, I think I mean, we, we've addressed this a couple times now, and I've said most of my piece on it. I guess I will just uh, keep my comments succinct and kind of do the the infamous positive negative positive uh sandwich uh critique um I, I think it's smart that the city is getting ahead of this um while they have the chance um i mean homelessness is everywhere um it is an issue and uh, whether we like it or not it's probably gonna increase in woolly just as it's increased in almost all municipalities across the state over the past few years. Um, so putting some sort of framework on this, I think is um, smart. And I think it's uh, the city doing its due diligence on behalf of its citizenry. Um, the negative, I'm, I'm still, I'm really worried about the enforcement piece of this. Um, you know, I, I wish, and I, I realize the limitations um, on this, and uh, the fact that you know we're we're trying not to be necessarily too aggressive with this. Um, but I just, you know, just I'm I'm just going to reiterate my concern that I'm I'm kind of worried about the enforcement mechanism. Um, I know uh, I had a conversation a separate conversation with a friend of mine who works with Family Promise and he's a volunteer there and uh, he was reaching out to me to help volunteer <clears throat> and while I, I wasn't available at the time um, you know he he did make the comment that you know they have been struggling to find volunteers and um, you know I think that that's that's not just in regards to organizations dealing with homelessness, I think that that's just kind of a universal problem. Most people aren't volunteering uh, nowadays. And so, you know, whether or not there will be adequate staffing to properly monitor and regulate these things um, is a bit of a question mark. You know, I would hope that there is, and um, I sincerely hope that, you know, we're able to staff these and these organizations can run these properly. Um, but I, I have, I have my doubts and my worries. Um, but finally, I'll, I'll just say that I'm glad that we are addressing homelessness rather than, um, kicking it down the road or trying to sweep it under the rug. I'm glad that we're, we are trying to do, take steps, um, where we can, when we can to walk that fine line between um, you know, taking care of uh, our citizens who um, are able to help themselves and maybe um, don't necessarily want to have to, you know, see an increase in homelessness in our community, but at the same time trying to help those who may not necessarily be able to help themselves or are just in situations that um, are out of their control and they've experienced circumstances that have led them to this point. Um, 
you know, I, I think that this will kind of help centralize um, encampments, and I think uh, religious organizations are good vehicles uh, to help provide services, because uh, I think that these people probably need some mental health services, some substance abuse services, uh, social services, what have you. And this probably helps um, identify these people because it'll help congregate them, help centralize them, and make it easier for social workers to reach out to them. So I think that there are a lot of positives, and I think that um, you know our, our homeless neighbors will benefit from it. Um, so even in spite of my reservations, I still I support moving forward with this and recommending it that the council pass. Commissioner Freiberger. Um, they're pretty minor things, but just uh, a question for um, our legal representative there, I guess a point of clarification. For on page 11, uh, 17110.060 under revocation of permit, in that first paragraph, it says that the director may revoke a temporary homeless encampment permit for violation of any of the requirements of this chapter, and then it goes on to mention two of those, just um, to call those out specifically, I assume. Um, is that, that the reason? Um, and to make special mention of those, since it already states that it may be revoked for any of the violation of any of the um, requirements? Sure, let me just navigate there one second. Okay, so you're referring to 17.110.060? That's correct. So the, the first sentence just says that the director may revoke this permit for violation of any of the above requirements for the permit, and then it goes on to basically call out in the next two sentences two of those instances. So I was just kind of um, wondering why those specifically, just to reinforce that, or I was yeah, thinking perhaps so it should say including the following, but I, I wasn't sure, so. To a certain extent, the the um, what it calls out is behavior that's not typical of any other zoning violation, right? There's nowhere else in 17 that uh, talks about the behavior of the residents. So specifically, that was put in there. So. Um, that the director has that authority to, if there are, you know, behavioral incidents, it's not, uh, you can't make that a criteria under the permit, although there is a section under here um, where people must abide by a code of conduct. So this is just kind of the failure to abide by that code of conduct. Okay. But that was also a very specific concern too of the planning commission the last time this was heard. Um, it, it did not change, but uh, I think it does create an additional hook, uh, an enforcement mechanism that might not otherwise be available in other parts of Chapter 17 that would need to be specifically addressed for this particular type of permit. Thank you. It, just to elaborate on that a little bit more, uh, one of my concerns be, before I move on to our other commissioners is uh, is the the situation where we're running multiple uh, trips of uh, PD or EMTs to some of these sites. And in this particular case, when we're talking about acts of violence and substance abuse or wh whatever we have that we want to codify, don't we want to put a little bit of a little bit more teeth in it that? If you, if you exceed X amount of, uh, let's say, 
PD calls in a specific period of time, that's going to constitute a violation of that requirement as well. Uh, you, you see, uh, resources are, are limited. That they're, they're not endless. But in, in a lot of particular cases, when you, you set up these facilities, a lot of people utilize them as just basically a free place to stay. And I'm not saying that's the case all the time. But uh, we're going to be talking about that, this in a little bit uh, regarding parking. How do we handle campers? But I'm going to get to that point when it's, when it's my time to talk. But in this particular case, if we're, we're looking at specific acts that are illegal, bottom line, don't we want to put something in there that actually adds into it? So it, it doesn't seem so subjective, right? It's like, oh, well, somebody got into a fight, and oh, yeah, there was an act of violence. But if PD was called in and they actually filed some type of police report based upon that action, that might be a little bit stronger to give the city the ability and the director the ability to say, hey, you had your warnings, you had your chances, but these are the rules and, you know, this is, you knew what you were getting into from day one. So I wouldn't mind seeing something in there that actually puts something in place that we have a mechanism that is, is legally binding as well. What are your thoughts on that? Part of the beauty of this proposal is that it gives the, the director a wide amount of discretion in imposing the penalties. So um, to the extent that we do not deviate too much from the existing enforcement mechanisms that apply to other types of permits, my recommendation would be to stick with the existing process and allowing the director kind of that wide latitude to, to say, okay, this was one very egregious act of violence, your permit's revoked, or there have been several, but there have been minor, you know, not draws on resources. I think that discretion is something that is um, pretty essential to the enforcement mechanism because as, as soon as you start kind of making a contract out of the legislation, it will get very difficult to, you, you're stuck to that, right? So the director then has to take action if those types of things are triggered. So I would say in general, if you can steer away from putting like a specific number of police calls um, that would trigger action on behalf of the director, steer away from that and, and really stick with the um, wide amount of discretion because that is where the city can really make those determinations. Okay, uh, from, from the way I was viewing it, this, this would just be something that uh, gives them uh, a, a reason for not only making that decision, but there's facts behind it that it doesn't feel like it's subjective. Like, oh, well, was the director having a bad day today? Right, you don't want to get into that. So that, to me, I just read it as a little bit ambiguous because it does give us a lot of flexibility but we also want to make sure that we have the authority to back it up for, for other reasons. But I think Title 18 covers a lot of that as well, so I'm not going to belabor the point. But thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Maddox. Um, I am generally in favor of this. I don't have any specific concerns about it. I, I do... Uh, I appreciate council's advice on <clears throat> um, that last issue. Uh, you know, I, I think that having wide latitude because it, it is hard to, you know, if the cops are called for something that turns out to be nothing mm -hmm. or, you know, there is one very egregious action, I, you know, I, I think that it's important to um, have, you know, the discretion of the, some discretion in, in how to deal with these things. If, if an encampment is becoming problematic, um, maybe there hasn't been a history of police calls, but there's, it's obvious that there's a problem there. And so, um, anyway, I, I'm in forward of, uh, going ahead and advancing this. Thank you. Commissioner Huggins. Hi. Um, 
I, uh, I think that uh, Commissioner Johnson's uh, synopsis uh, pretty well summed it up for me. I mean, that's pretty much my, my feelings about the positives and the negatives. And I feel that we're um, at the point here where we have to uh, trust that we've done pretty much everything we can and need to uh, 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 let this uh, run and see how it um, and see how it works. Uh, we can tweak it later, but um, but I think that we're getting to the point where, uh, like uh, Ms. Quinn said, that uh, if we if we um, if we start uh, putting a lot of screws to it, then uh, it's going to make it hard for them to do it. So it's like anything we do with planning. When you get about 95% of the way there, then uh, then you need to uh, to see how it goes. So yeah, I'm con I'm concerned uh, about this. Uh, because it feels like, in a way, like an invitation. On the other hand, I agree with uh, Mr. Johnson that the uh, that the city is really smart to get out in front of this. So, um, I also, uh, I guess, am positive uh, moving forward on this. So, anyway, that's uh, that's my feelings. Thank you. So, the only thing I had a, a question on it was more of a technical aspect of it. It was in seventeen one ten o three o number seven, and it deals with parking. Okay, parking for at a minimum of five vehicles shall be provided. I see a lot of people in campers. How do we deal with uh, the camper issue? And I'm using this as an example. So the Skagit Motel seems to get quite a bit of, uh, let's say, a lot of different people living in that space that I could easily see those types of uh, individuals potentially needing a, uh, a camp like this to get them through a tough time. But I've also noticed this black camper there that just is parked on the outside. And we don't have really anything in here that deals with uh, vehicles that are a heck of a lot larger than a typical, let's say, 9 by 18 or 24 foot uh, parking spot. How are we going to handle the camper aspect of it? Or is this something we can worry about later on, John or Nicole? Thoughts? I, I think this is uh, something for Tara to weigh in on. Sure. Well, a couple thoughts there. It sounds like, you know, the motel situation is not a religious organization, and this proposal is very specific to the religious organization aspect. So um, that being said, there is, you, there is an ordinance right now that exists that says that the motorhomes cannot be parked for... I believe it's 30 days. Correct me if I'm wrong, John. Um, Correct. And that is already uh, a violation of the zoning code. The city could take action, um, basically starting with a letter all the way to perhaps a public nuisance or a lawsuit, something to that effect. Um, there are regulations that exist on the, the parking issue of RVs. Yeah, but my question was more the, the individuals that are going to use these facilities, and I'm not looking at that one particular issue, are we saying that you cannot have a camper and now decide that you're going to utilize one of these uh, homeless encampments as a, a temporary shelter? Is that what we're saying here by just saying five vehicles and not allowing campers? Because that's what, kind of what I'm hearing. I guess I hadn't considered the camper issue. Um, I don't read this as prohibiting campers as a facet of safe parking. But that runs in, that's contrary to the, the code where it's 30 days. So now are we saying, because somebody will show up with a camper, I guarantee you, okay? So we're saying now that you have 180 days to be part of this homeless encampment and have your camper on that site. And I'm just looking at what we have written up here, that we don't accommodate that vehicle size or the space requirement that you might have for a 30, 40 foot uh, unit. So, are, I know vehicles are defined, and I would have to look again at the definition of vehicles to give you a, a more educated answer, so give me a moment here. 
Joe, this is Silas. I might have a comment on that. Um, I, I think there's a distinction between a camper that's parked inside a, or, or on a church property as part of a homeless encampment and a camper that's parked on city property as uh, maybe directly outside of the homeless mm -hmm. encampment or anywhere else on the city right away. And so the way I, I mean, <clears throat> I might be missing something, but I don't see any reason why a camper couldn't be part of one of these homeless encampments because a lot of homeless people are living in campers. And, and as long as it's contained within the private property that this uh, encampment is set up on, um, a camper that's parked on the city right away is an entirely different story and then would be subject to the pre-existing city uh, zoning codes as we just discussed. So that's the way I see it, but um, I, I'm not sure if that answers anything. No, I, I'm clear on that. My, my only question was, was more, again, technical on how much space do we need. That's fine if somebody's going to bring a camper, and I agree with you that, that a lot of people do. How do we want to handle the space? We're just saying a minimum of uh, five parking spots. So we have 35 people max on an encampment, and five people show up with 40-foot trailers. I mean, is there something that we want to put in here that makes sure that that facility has enough of available parking if, in fact, uh, those are the uh, types of uh, guests they want to accommodate? That, that, that's my only question, not the fact that somebody's going to pull up with it or not. They are. But do we want to put something in here that at least uh, gives a uh, size requirement on how to, uh, to have that capability? And I mean, think about it. Campers have the ability to connect power, water, waste, a whole bunch of different things. So but my, my question was just simply, do we have something in here that accommodates a sufficient amount of space to actually handle those types of uh, vehicles? That was it. That, that, that was all I was pointing out. And just to confirm, vehicle is not a defined term. So arguably, somebody driving an RV could be parking in one of these spots. Mm -hmm. Now, is the... The 30-day rule, is that entirely exclusive to city right-of-ways? Because I, I was of the understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought even if, like, you know, someone had someone staying in an RV in their driveway, you know, it's entirely off the public right-of-way, it's on their private property, but my understanding is those people can't occupy it for more than 30 days. Am I wrong with that? No, that, that's true. Um, it, 1744060 says, um, oops, sorry, uh, I'm in the wrong section here. Uh, to, to, no, no trailer or recreational vehicle shall be occupied as a residence for more than 30 days within the space of one year unless approved in accordance with Chapter 17.64. So that's not exclusive to right of way and it's not exclusive to private property, um, it's everywhere. How do we police that? Because there's a, quite a bit of it going on right now in town. I can point to several properties. That they're, they're not only there permanently, I mean, they have nice well, little... Our, co our, co our code enforcement officer um, regulate, uh, um, does enforcement on that, and uh -huh. she's actively doing so all the time. Okay. So anyone else? So, Go ahead, I'm sorry. Getting, get, getting back to the, the other issue, the way, the way I would read this uh, ordinance is, you know, there, there is a little bit of a conflict between the 30-day and, um, and the 180 day allowance in the safe parking. However, um, if there's a safe parking situation going on um, that has, you know, notified the city and meets all of these requirements, um, Tara, I don't, I don't see this as saying that uh, they can't let be in RVs on that site. Um, as with just about every ordinance, when there's a 
Uh, I'm sure at the end of this, I'm scrolling to see if there's a notice, if there's a conflict between two ordinances, how it's addressed. It usually says this one will, uh, will overrun it. Now, there the is. intent is to allow for the 180 days. So um, as long as they're following those regulations at an approved encampment, I think what this says is that, you know, that normal 30 day would not apply on one of these permitted sites. And uh, so section eight, and I think it's the very last page of this, uh, at least the last page of the ordinance says, conflict in the event there's a conflict between the provision of this ordinance and any other city ordinance, the provision of this ordinance shall control, which mm, legally says this one uh, is more important, but they all say that. So I don't know how that works. Hey. So. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't we want it to be part of the, um, their plan? I mean, they, they have to, they have to create a, a plan document to do their, to do their encampment. And so wouldn't they just have to cover that in their thing, how they're going to handle, um, um, multiple, uh, or, uh, multiple, uh, trailer units and things like that as, you know, address it in their plan. So the, the, um, parking accommodation would not require the, it's not a permit and does not require a plan. Um, we, we could, re we could require one, but we just didn't anticipate that. Um, seems like that would be a lot of administrative burden on the staff for the amount of risk that would be mitigated. Anyone else before I uh, move on to uh, the recommended uh, motion by staff? Commissioner Johnson. Weiberger, good. Okay, at this point, would someone like to make a motion to recommend that the City Council adopt the proposed amendments to Title 17 SWMC to establish requirements for homeless encampments operated by religious organizations and associated amendments to Chapter 2.90 SWMC Consolidated Planning Procedures to address temporary permitting to address permitting for temporary homeless encampments. Do I have a first? I so move. Commissioner Freiberger has made a first motion. Do I have a second? I'll second it. I have a second from Commissioner Maddox. At this point, we have a first and a second. First by Commissioner Freiberger, second by Commissioner Maddox. Is there any further discussion? With that, I'm going to go for a, in favor or opposed, but I'm going to go one by one. This way it's clear as to uh, what people's positions are. So all in favor, starting with Commissioner Huggins. In favor. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Freiberger. Aye. Commissioner Maddox. Aye. Commissioner Fatizi. Aye. So we are, we are in favor, six, none opposed, motion carries. Thank you very much. Good job. Good job, staff. On to our second public meeting. The more fun stuff, in my opinion, anyway. Possible amendments to Title 17 SWMC to address retail uses associated with breweries, distilleries, and wineries in the industrial and commercial zones. With that, John or Nicole, would you like to uh, reiterate the overview that we, we've been, been, been through a couple times? But anyway, it's, here you go. I can I can take this. So, and for the record, on the previous one, you said uh, five. Or you said six um, in favor on the uh, correct for the approval of the previous ordinance. I believe there's only five commissioners uh, on. Oh, um, I apologize. It's five of us. Yep, up, up. Just 
Just to be clear for the record, right. it's absolutely. Five, five, yeah, yeah. Two. I no, would have caught it in the minutes. That, 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 John. That's on. That's it. on me. Sorry. Okay. So um, this. Uh, the next public hearing is for amendments to define alcohol production establishments um, and to add alcohol production establishments as a permitted use in the mixed commercial and industrial zone uh, to make amendments to chapter 1724 to add alcohol production established as a conditional use permit in the central business district. Um, as you can see from the memo, this all this started with the uh, conversations with the council um, Committee on um, uh, Economic Development, uh, ways to encourage um, breweries. What we had noticed, staff had noticed that um, breweries are allowed in the industrial zone now, but they are not allowed uh, to have um, associated um, retail areas, uh, particularly restaurants because um, they're limited to 5% in the industrial zone. So we wanted to get with the times and see what other cities are doing for breweries uh, um, as to how they regulate them and how they, what zones are allowed in and, and how they're allowed to have restaurants in certain zones. And uh, that through that process, as Nicole was researching this in depth, um, she had the good idea to expand it to wineries and uh, and distilleries as well. Um, so we we expanded it to include to also address wineries and distilleries. We had uh, this on the agenda for a public hearing. I think it was in October, but we did not have a quorum. So um, we didn't, and so we did not have time on the agenda in November to discuss this topic. So we brought it back to the planning commission this time for a public hearing. In the meantime, uh, we had some conversations with people that actually are looking at operating a brewery and currently operate a winery. And so we got some really good feedback on how this regulate these regulations could affect uh, those uses. And in fact, they were very supportive of the way the ordinance was written, but we were able to fine tune it and go back and do some more research that Nicole provided in the staff report. So this time, uh, there's uh, some slight amendments to even make it clearer um, and more research for the Planning Commission to review. So hopefully you've had a chance to go through uh, Nicole's well-written staff report and uh, it answers a lot of the questions that had come up at the uh, September discussion in, in more detail than the uh, October staff report I, I believe had. So we're ready to have a public hearing on this and uh, and, and look forward to he hearing the Planning Commission's discussion. That's Thanks. all I have. So prior to opening, I'll go through my little disclosure. If you would like to speak, please state your name and address or any group or organization you represent, uh, both in the audience as well as online. So I will now open up our second public hearing at 722 PM. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to uh, comment on uh, our possible amendments to Title 17? Yes. How about sir. it? Please introduce yes. yourself. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, Chair Fatizi and Commissioners, my name is Terry Sapp. I reside at 804 Ferry Street in Cedro Woolley. Uh, however, it will be pertinent to my comments that I also am a farmer. I farm east of Cedar Woolley on a legacy farm that has been in our family three generations and another nearby farm with my wife, Jean Eagleston, who is here tonight also. And I speak because this topic has been a subject of uh, substantial study and uh, investigation by me in a tangential way. 
I represent here that uh, I need to disclose here, but I am not representing in my expressions now the Agricultural Advisory Board of Skagit County. I am a member and that Agricultural Advisory Board has been wrestling with the issue, uh, uh, an issue similar to this for several years. The question before the county commissioners has been, shall the agricultural zone allow various kinds of commercial retail enterprises to be sited within the zone, some of which are now present but not authorized, and many of which uh, are uh, uh, known to be intended in the agricultural zone, some because they have uh, a, a suggested association with agriculture. To the point, some of those are wineries, breweries, distilleries, and restaurants. I'll add one more uh, flavor to that selection, which is a term um, remote tasting rooms. This collection of, uh, of uh, commercial retail kinds of enterprises have um, a large following and the county has now to deal with whether allowances should be created to allow such retail enterprises to be in the agricultural zone, which is restricted in many ways to agriculture. I'll come to a point that I think is pertinent to the city in just a moment, but by way of getting there, I want to uh, 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 apprise you that this issue has been very actively uh, fraught and troubled in King County. Wineries, breweries, distilleries, and remote tasting rooms cropped up in the agricultural zone in the Sammamish Valley near Woodenville, which encouraged such things, but it turned out that uh, enterprising entrepreneurs found that they could place these kinds of facilities in garages, barns, outbuildings, and have a much... Uh, freer, easier, and less costly uh, facility for entertaining the public. The rule there had been that they could only be so if they produced this kind of product on site, but the reason, that's the reason the remote tasting rooms became part of the discussion, that being that some of these facilities were really representing large vintners in the eastern part of the state and were just uh, showcase tasting rooms. Uh, quickly, I'll close that point by saying, since 2017, which an ordinance by, the King, by King County was passed, it was challenged by the agricultural interests that went to the Puget Sound, Central Puget Sound Growth Management Hearings Board uh, to the Superior Court, back to the Hearings Board, and has now been invalidated by the, hear the Growth Management Hearings Board and remanded to King County to rewrite an ordinance. The ordinance is now uh, uh, in print. An ordinance is in print, not yet officially proposed. Okay, that's King County. It's very instructive for the work I have been doing trying to understand what we should do in Skagit County. Opportune that you are considering this issue because, to state my case uh, clearly, agricultural interests in this county do not discourage these kinds of activities but would like to see them cited in cities, not out scattered hither and hither across a zone that is not intended for them and cause retail activity and the issue then becomes if it's a brewery should it have a 
restaurant associated with it, if it has a restaurant, can it have a wedding venue, and so the in commercial enterprise retail oriented activities start to crop up in the ag zone. It's a very troubled issue right now in the county and it, the county commissioners are not yet settled. Staff is still working on it. Legislation is now being written. Hearings have been had, etc. I don't mean to take your time with the issues in the county except to say it would be lovely, in my opinion, to see more encouragement and siting of these kinds of facilities in the cities where sewers, proper water facilities, <coughs> and proper access by the public to these kinds of perhaps very suitable kinds of enterprises to many people should be cited. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I believe, Terry, you're the only, oh, here we go. <laughs> Philip Murray, 101 West Woodworth, mailing address. If I can do this, um, I personally think that they should be uh, held into the industrial area. Um, you have a lot of bars and stuff in town already. Um, the other thing is, has anybody applied for this? And if you did apply for it and you have to change the rules, wouldn't they be having to pay like a $600, 50 something like that fee to do this? And you're doing it b beforehand. And I do wonder if anybody here on the board has family or anything that is going to be wanting to do this in their own building, which it seems like a conflict of interest if they're voting on it or anything like that. So, um, just a thought, and uh, thank you. Thank you. I think that's it for our audience participation. Uh, Bill, do we have anyone online that uh, would like to make any comments on this second public hearing? I'm assuming that would be a no. So at this time, I would like to close second public hearing at 7.31 p.m. and start our uh, planning commission discussion. And we'll start with you, Commissioner Freiberger. How's that? So I just had a um, question for um, Nicole, um, and let me get my pages up here. So on page four of the memo, paragraph three, not including the partial paragraph at the top of the page, but... Um, that final sentence says out, outdoor seating areas have been specifically excluded from floor area calculations and any kitchen floor area is to be counted in the calculation for production floor area. But um, in every definition that I saw down in the actual individual zones, it looked like the kitchen area was included in the commercial retail. So I just wanted to clarify which is it and which one did we want. Okay. That's all I have. I'm sorry, we weren't able to hear what Nicole said. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, correct that to retail commercial. It should not say production. <laughs> okay. Commissioner Thank Huggins, you. do you have any uh, commentary? Uh, not at this point. Um, I have nobody uh, in my family who's going to open a uh, one of these establishments. <laughs> Commissioner Maddox. Um, I, I like the ordinance as it's currently written. Um, I think the percentages largely reflect what we discussed, or my at least my memory of what we discussed previously. Um, I uh, believe it was Mr. Sapp who spoke, and I just want to um, <clears throat> thank him for his insightful comments and say that I, too, uh, 
would much rather see these types of establishments within our city limits um, than uh, taking over the agricultural zone. I um, have been following that discussion um, and, you know, I certainly am concerned about uh, the commercialization uh, uh, or the retailization of the agricultural zone. And um, I do uh, have some concern about uh, the conversion of industrial land in Cedro Woolley uh, to sort of retail commercial uses. Um, as somebody who, uh, you know, has a semi uh, that's involved with industry. I, I think that, you know, our industrial land is precious. Um, but I, I do see the benefit economically of this, and I'm not going to argue against uh, this allowance in the industrial zone. And so uh, on, based on all of that, I, I am in favor of the ordinance and um, I don't have any further uh, concerns at this time. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Um, I would second uh, Commissioner Maddox's comments about uh, Mr. Sapp's points being very well taken and very appreciative. and. Uh, that's really great insight, and I wholeheartedly agree that um, the precious ag land that we do have should be reserved for ag purposes. Um, and for the record, um, neither I nor a family member at this time are actively looking to start a brewery or any other sort of alcohol production uh, facility. Um, I will ask so under the industrial use section uh, so that would be paragraph 11 under 1728010 um, I was kind of curious as to why the industrial portion would have a, a less of a minimum than uh, the CBD would um, I would probably promote having more of a production facility or allowing um, or encouraging, maybe is the better word, of production within the industrial zone. I mean, I, I fully think that you can easily accommodate, you know, tasting rooms and, and uh, breweries and whatnot uh, within the industrial zone. Woodenville is a, a classic example of that in some respects, and so are other municipalities. Um, but maybe keeping to the integrity of what an industrial zone is supposed to be, maybe encouraging those to be more focused um, on production than necessarily the retail aspect of it. So I was going to suggest maybe increasing the minimum from 50% to 60%. Um, I'm not necessarily married to that, but that was just kind of a, a thought that I had. My recollection is that we were discussing if somebody were to open a small facility, um, if you, if you think of like a distillery, they don't, they don't take up a lot of space for the, the actual work area and storage area if they're small. And I think the idea was to give some flexibility to allow you know a small scale like that still have a tasting room or a small restaurant area without it being you know mostly restaurant, um, I think that was the idea. Also, uh, Commissioner Johnson, it, the regulations are flip flop between the uh, in the CBD a minimum of sixty percent shall be for retail and commercial use where. Um, in the industrial, a minimum uh, of 50% has to be used for production. So um, uh, that, that, that is a good catch. Um, my, my, it's an opposite, you know, they're, they're written oppositely. No, that, that is a good catch. Thank you. Uh, my point would still stand that I would think that the, indus the industrial zone 
type facility should be geared more towards the production end of things than the retail end of things. But no, that is a good point. You know, depending on who operates it, though, the, the minimum is 50%. They could easily want 70% of their floor area. So we're, we're doing a percentage based upon the, the gross uh, floor area to uh, accommodate whatever what particular operation they want to do. So I don't really have a problem with that minimum of 50, but I, I get what you're saying. Anyway, anyone else before I throw my own opinions in here? So first of all, really good job on, on a lot of your research. I mean, you know, that for me, knowing a lot of these jurisdictions, I was curious how they, they did it. And it's a lot of work to, to dig that stuff up. And Mr. Sapp, you're, 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 you're totally dialed in, and that's exactly what we're trying to accommodate, is to have that, those types of services and operations get out of the agricultural areas and actually have an in-city uh, way of getting something done. But our code's pretty tight. If you're looking at our CBD and the MC and the industrials, I don't see too many garages that you're going to start throwing taps in and all of a sudden you're going to open on up. But we're a little bit tighter than that because we want a quality product, right? You want something that the public is going to want to participate in. And a lot of the operations that we've used as examples, they're very family-oriented as to where we're not looking at like bar shots and that, that kind of stuff. It's, it, it's a very different product at the uh, end of the day. So I really do appreciate everybody's comments, and I thank you. So with that, would somebody like to make a motion to recommend that the City Council approve the proposed amendments to SWMC 17.04.030, 17.20.010, 17.24.010, 17.28.010 to address alcohol production establishments? I need a first and a second. So moved. Commissioner Maddox has made a first. Do I have a second? I'll second that. I have a second from Commissioner Freiberger. So at this point, we have a first and second. Is there any further discussion? We'll take that as a no. So I'm going to do what I did before. I'm going to go one by one. Commissioner Huggins, favor or opposed? Uh, in favor. Commissioner Johnson? In favor. Commissioner Freiberger? In favor. Commissioner Maddox? In favor. Commissioner Fatizi, in favor. So we have five in favor, zero opposed. The motion carries. Thank you. So now moving on to our third public hearing. Requested amendments to the accessory dwelling unit ADU regulations in Chapter 17.100. SWMC to address ADUs for, spe for spec built homes. Homes, <laughs> excuse me. So, John or Nicole, would you like to uh, start us off here before I open it up? All right. So, this, uh, if you can remember way back when, when we started on this project, this was proposed, um, proposed amendments to the ADU regulations to. Um, allow spec homes to have ADUs. In other words, when new homes are built by uh, speculation builders, you know these are not these are not uh, not people who are building a house for themselves, but a, a, a builder who builds a house and, uh, and then just tries to sell it on the the, the open market. Um, it was requested by one of our local developers, BYK Construction, to amend our AD regulations so that when they build these spec homes, they can build them with an ADU um, as part of their marketing idea. And at uh, the last planning commission meeting, the um, we had a discussion with uh, Paul Woodmancy of BYK Construction came in and, and spoke to the planning commission about what he was trying to achieve with his proposed language. The planning commission um, approved the staff to go ahead and draft some language within code to achieve the goals of 
the of what BYK construction was trying to achieve. And so that is what we proposed, uh, what, what staff put together in this, um, in this draft. It's actually quite a small a number of words to achieve the, the goal that uh, BYK was aiming to implement. And uh, those are on page seven of this staff report. And um, so the language, I'll just read it because it is short enough. Um, under the section um, in the ADU ordinance where it says that the property owner must live on site, um, uh, we added the language saying spec homes may be constructed with an associated ADU under the following conditions. Prior to sale, the, the, uh, the spec builder shall notify the prospective purchasers in writing of the limitations of, on ADUs and the requirements of chapter 17100 Cedar Valley Municipal Code, including the owner occupancy requirement. During the, the number two, during the closing process of the sale, a covenant stating that the owner resides at the property shall be signed by the purchaser and recorded with the Skagit County Auditor by the title company. Um, and number three, the buyer is required to submit a copy of the recorded covenant to the planning department after recording. So what this says is um, if a spec builder builds a house with an ADU, um, staff can, uh, can review and approve that. And then they'll be required to um, notify whoever's buying the property of all of the regulations and ADUs, which is in chapter 17100, <clears throat> um, including, and most importantly, the owner occupancy requirement. And then um, the, the owner needs to sign something and, and record it and then return it to, to city staff so that we know that, uh, that they are aware of, of the ADU, of the homeowner occupancy requirements, and they know that they'll be following those rules. The way this is intended is um, the spec builder would still have to get an ADU permit, much like a homeowner does now when they wanna get a, an ADU, they would apply for a, an ADU permit before they do the construction. So we would still require that in, of, the, um, of the spec builder, which we could in theory just run at the same time as, as the building permit. So this is just one really um, minor, minor point before we even start this, in that the uh, line number two where you have the uh, recorded with the Skagit County auditor by the title company, the, the correct language would be by the closing agent. That recording will show up on a title, but it's actually the closing agent that does the recordings. It could be attorneys, it could be departments within title companies, it could be companies that just specialize in, in the closing process. So technically, that's not exactly correct. Then, you know, I actually didn't really like the, that. Um, I struggled with, with that last line. So I, I'm wondering if it would just make sense for us to say uh, property uh, shall be signed by the purchaser and recorded with the Skagit County Auditor, period. Because it really doesn't matter who records it. Correct. Yeah, no, that, that um, works too. That, that's fine. So that would be my recommendation is just to strike the mm -hmm. by the title company portion of line two. That works. Sorry, I didn't mean to delay our opening. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anything else? Okay. At this point, I will open up public hearing number three at 748 p.m. and back to what my normal disclosure is. If you would like to speak, please state your name and address or any group or organization you represent. So with that, is there anyone in the audience that has any comment on public hearing number three? I will take that as a no. And, Go ahead. I'm sorry. And a reminder, uh, you know, try to keep it close to three minutes. Duly noted.
Is there anyone online that has any uh, comments regarding public hearing number three? I will also take that as a no. So at this point, I will close public hearing number three at 7.49 p.m. and on to uh, Planning Commission discussion. And I'll start with you, uh, Commissioner Huggins. I'm just skipping around. There's no rhyme or reason to it. Pat? Well, I think everybody knows my concerns with um, ADUs in, uh, in general, and, um, and I think I voted against the ordinance originally <laughs> on this one. So um, I, um, I am inclined to vote against this as well. Um, I think you guys have done a great job of uh, uh, putting it together and covering the topics, but it still doesn't uh, alleviate my concerns for people who um, uh, the fact that it uh, doubles the zoning uh, density in some cases and also uh, makes it so that uh, people, if the d developers are already building spec houses on the lots, um, that may preclude, depending on how things happen in the future, uh, people who need one at a later date from, uh, from having uh, the opportunity to uh, build one on their own property. So anyway, um, I'm, I'm inclined against it at, at this point, but uh, not totally opposed, so. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Um, <clears throat> I share Commissioner Huggins' sentiments. Um, and if it wasn't for the fact that, you know, there it really is on the horizon, um, some legislation being pushed um i i think much like the first public hearing i think it's good that the city's getting ahead of the game on this and putting in some regulations um so that it can be you know woolly centric with our thumbprint on it versus a edict from olympia so i'm i'm glad that um you know in that in that respect i'm glad that we're doing this you know if it wasn't for that pressure, I, I'm not in. I'm not uh, philosophically. I'm not um, not entirely against ADUs. Um, I, I do see their value. Um, I do think that property owners, uh, to some degree, uh, well regulated, should be able to to add these. Uh, with that, you know, I, I did support it, and with that. Being said, you know, I, I feel like this is a very reasonable ask from BYK. It makes sense. I think it was just a simple oversight on our part, um, and I I think that it it's kind of like what you said, Commissioner Huggins, earlier. You know, we we take things you know 95 percent of the way, and then we we make adjustments. And I think that this is a classic example of that and a, a good catch by BYK and this is just one of those adjustments that we're needing to clean up a little bit. Um, so, you know, I I don't have a whole lot, I, I don't have anything negative to say against it, I don't have a whole lot to say for it. Um, I, I would just say, um, and I know I asked um, Paul at the last meeting about parking and I know that as a developer, that's an added cost, and he, he talked about that being an added cost. Um, but, you know, my concern still exists with parking, um, you know, providing enough spaces. You know, I, I just have a feeling, having lived in multifamily housing for a significant amount of time, um, you know, just because it's a smaller space doesn't mean that there's not going to be more vehicles. We're a vehicle-centric uh, society, and, you know, there's going to be, you know, significant others. You know, even if it's a single person, there's going to be significant others coming, you know, frequently, friends coming. Chances are they'll probably um, find ways to save costs more by trying to get roommates or... You know, landlords will try to increase their uh, rental income by adding additional people if possible. So I, I just feel like two spaces would be a more appropriate amount. Um, I realize it's a little bit off topic from what we're talking here, but since we're opening it up um, and re-reviewing this, 
this particular ordinance site, I would strongly recommend that we move from one off street parking spot to two. Um, but that's, that's my only real critique at this point of this ordinance. Commissioner Freiberger. So something that Mr. Woodmansey had mentioned in his suggested added language was that the builder uh, must acknowledge the requirement of the covenant with the closing of the property. And when um, looking at the proposed language, um, I was wondering if there's anything, I don't see anything in here that the builder has to sign anything saying that they will notify the buyer unless I'm just missing it. Um, because we don't really have any way of controlling what happens once we've finaled a um, permit. So unless it's built into the accessory dwelling unit permit that it won't be issued without the prospective buyer signing off, but these are spec homes. So presumably that happens before um, it's bought potentially. So is there an issue there? That's all I wanted to. Well, um, the, the first line that um, number one there on page seven says prior to the sale, the spec home builder shall notify prospective purchasers in writing of the limitations of ADUs. And do they and have the requirements. to Oh, sorry. And I was just completing the reading it and the requirements of chapter 17, 100 SWMC, including the owner occupancy requirement. So th that doesn't, um, was there something more that uh, we wanted to require of the builder? So they have to notify them in writing. Are they then supposed to provide that notification to the city as proof? Is there a requirement for that as part of the uh, ADU process for uh, spec homes? Yeah, there, there, there kind of is. I'm just looking at it from a more practical standpoint of exactly what would happen. And since it's already on, on the books anyway, I agree with Commissioner Johnson that it's just something that we, we missed. So what a builder is going to sell a home to somebody, right? I look at this more as an option. It's like, hey, you know, it's like doing like a certain uh, type of kitchen cabinets or whatever. So the builder says, hey, you have the option if you want an ADU and here's that notice, but this is what you need to do. Now at closing, and that number two there, that this needs to be recorded, that is their legal obligation to say that, hey, I'm gonna be compliant with uh, SWMC 17.100, and that, that's like a contingency that would be need to be satisfied at that closing. We haven't had this happen yet, but that's just my assumption of, of how that would definitely work, and that's the, the, the way it gets done in all types of different things, not just ADUs. So that, that's where that teeth is, is in that second, uh, that second line there. Except for if that happens after the permit has already been approved and then there is nothing to guarantee well, Yeah, that. you can't close on it. You can't close on it until you satisfy that okay. contingency. Okay. I mean, you might have a situation where all of a sudden the deal falls apart and they, the buyer loses their earnest money. So if second buyer comes on in, hey, here's the same thing. It's got an ADU. And uh, would that limit the uh, potential uh, the builder? I mean, they'd kind of be on the hook for it, but they'd have to have a very specific buyer that wants that ADU to be compliant with those second terms. Okay. Yeah. Because I was just thinking if the covenant hasn't been recorded yet, who's to say they can't just it close at, it? It happens at closing. Yeah. Without. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And there's all types of contingencies in real estate deals, but this would be one of them. Anyway, I saved Commissioner Maddox for last. So, Commissioner Maddox. Um, I, I'm in favor of it. I mean, you all know my uh, oppositions to the owner occupancy requirement, but uh, I think this makes sense. I think ADUs uh, make sense, gen you know, uh, in general terms and provide 
uh, much needed housing options. I know that if I was to uh, move or buy a new place, it would have to have an ADU or the ability to build an ADU um, as my in-laws live with me. And so uh, anyway, I'm in favor. I don't have any other further comments. Okay, thank you. So everyone knows my position. It, it, it's already in the code. You could already do it now. So I look at this as something that we missed. And as long as we're clear on the process of the owner occupancy based upon what's in the code, okay, I, I think this is just uh, something that we missed. And uh, I'm glad it was brought to our attention. And it does give people flexibility. And I, I think we use this as a one example. Let's say you have a retired couple that is looking for additional income or that they have relatives or somebody that needs to live with them. And I can see a lot of situations where elderly parents need to live with a, a family. It just makes a lot of sense if you can get this done on, a, on new construction. There's going to be more continuity in the design, and uh, I think it'll flow a lot easier. So at this particular point, would someone like to make a motion to recommend that the City Council approve the proposed amendments to Chapter 17.100 SWMC. Do I have a first? So moved. Commissioner Maddox has a first. Do I have a second? Second. Commissioner uh. Johnson has a second to beat you to it. Okay. At this time, is there any further discussion? Okay, so with that being, I will take a vote for all in favor. And again, I will start one by one. Commissioner Huggins, in favor or opposed? I'm going to vote in favor this time, but I'd like to express my um, feelings that uh, I'm doing. Don't like this because the state of Washington is uh, driving this process and not the community of Cedar Woolley. Um, but yes, I'm in favor. Duly, con Thank you. duly noted, Commissioner. I, I, I hear you. Commissioner Johnson. Um, I support it. Aye. Commissioner Freiberger. Aye. Commissioner Maddox. Aye. Commissioner Fatizi. Aye. Motion passes and carries 5-0. So on to our final uh, portions of the meeting. There's no unfinished business. Now, John, I'm going to throw this out to you on the new business, the... Uh, Mr. Sapp and uh, Gene are here. Uh, how do you want to start this? Do you want to do an intro on this and have these folks come on up? Oh, yeah. And how, how do you want to do I'm this? Gonna, I'm going to have to. There's there's a lot more going on here than, than their specific request. Okay. So there, there's, there's a lot to unpack. Okay. All right. So hopefully the, count, uh, the Planning Commission had a chance to, to read um the, the the memo there's there's a as I said there's a, a lot going on so last week the the city council passed a historic preservation ordinance and what that enables is uh, that's created a historic review board it's created a mechanism to designate historic, properties. It's created a mechanism to create historic uh, districts. Um, and then further down the line, there's some other ramifications of, of that um, process that uh, is where we get into the discussion of the SAP's specific project. So before we get into the, the special valuation part of what the historic, what the historic uh, preservation ordinance allows. I need to talk to the pl planning commission about all of the other major factors of this that need to be done before we can even discuss any specific projects. So as you, as you uh, hopefully saw in the ordinance, the, uh, the ordinance created a historic preservation commission now that's a five-member historic or uh, a five-member commission that uh, is going to be populated with people that are um, ha that are uh, have special expertise in historic preservation building, 
and that is uh, specified in the ordinance. Before the council can uh, can appoint that historic preservation board, they wanted the they wanted uh, the historic preservation board to exist, uh, largely so we could address the SAPS project. Um, so what we did is we wrote in the ordinance until such time that the uh, historic preservation board is created, the planning commission will act as the historic preservation board. So that gives you, as the planning commission, the ability to act as the historic preservation commission in the in the meantime. Um, so the core duties of the historic preservation commission is to review which properties in the city have possible historic uh, meaning and uh, could possibly be put on a historic registry list. So that's the first step is identifying properties in the city that have historic merit. And it goes for uh, properties, not just buildings. So uh, it could be uh, cemeteries, and you probably saw some language in here about, you know, if you're designating a, a, a cemetery as historic. So it's, uh, you know, a, his, a historic property is much broader meaning than just a specific property. It's not particularly relevant to our conversation today, but it, it's an important concept to understand. Um, once we've created the inventory of historic places, then the uh, commission can review applications for placement or removal from the Cedro Valley Register of Historic Places. So that is the actual list of what gets designated. So we've got, hey, here's our wish list over here. That's our that's the first list that we create. And then from that, we, we pick and choose from applications and say, do we want the any of these properties to actually be on our historic register. And that's a much more meaningful action. Um, and that is something that you'll be doing today. Uh, the, the commission's also tasked with uh, the reviewing building projects related to any property that's on the historic register of places, uh, the Cedar Willie register of historic places. So say there's a property that is uh, designated on the, uh, the Cedar Willie Historic Register, and they want to change a window. So that would come to the, the Historic Preservation Commission for review to make sure that it meets all of the regulations in place for historically registered buildings. Now that's, you know, changing a window is you know, a very specific minor thing, but it could also go for, um, you know, if they want to do an addition or if they want to do a remodel or if they want to you know, do significant changes to the siding, uh, weatherization upgrades, those sorts of things. Would Once a property is on the historic register, then those uh, all get um, reviewed by the, by the local review board. And the reason... The reason that we do that is um, properties that are listed on the historic register have the opportunity to apply to the Skagit County Assessor for a reduction in their tax assessment. And that's the next thing that the this planning commission is going to be addressing today is um, the, the, the SAP Eagleston property has been designated on the state historic registry board they've requested to be put on our historic registry as well and then the Skagit County assessor will be able to uh, assess their property at a lower tax rate um, in specific the their, their property uh, is uh, will receive a, a tax reduction on the value based on <clears throat> well you know it's a it's a little complicated. How the assessor is going to, uh, to apply it is is unclear to me because that's not in statute. 
but the requirements are that they have to spend a certain value of their property on a restoration project um, in order to be eligible. And so they did uh, do a restoration project and you probably saw some numbers in the packet that they submitted stating how much they spent on the restoration versus the assessed value of their home prior to the restoration. And then, uh, so they had to meet that certain threshold in order to be qualified for this tax reduction. And, uh, and the historic the state historic board reviewed that and it does uh, meet that criteria. So I have three requests of the planning commission and I, and I put those in, um, in bold in the memo starting on page uh, three and continuing on to page four. Um, one is to, <clears throat> um, is to add the house, add the, the 804 Ferry Street house to the Cedar Rulli Register of Historic Places, and then uh, enter into an historic preservation agreement with the applicants um, for that property. And that is included as an attachment. That's something that the state statutes require. Uh, as you can see, RCW 84.26.0502 requires this uh, agreement. And then um, presuming the Historic Preservation Commission wants to do that, then we'd make a motion to approve and sign the certificate of approval for special valuation on historical property for 804 Ferry Street. And that's, the, that's a document that we then send to the assessor saying, yes, we certify that it meets the requirements for this lower assessed valuation. And here's our John Hancock. And so you can go ahead and do that to the assessor. Um, we should also, before we add this property to the, uh, um, to the official Cedar Rulli Register of Historic Places, <clears throat> we should probably just make mention that uh, 804 Ferry Street is a property of significance and uh, we'd, we'd like to put that on our Cedar Rulli inventory of possible historic places before we actually put it on the registry. That way we've got belt and suspenders and everything. I think this is the way the state statutes and our new ordinance 2029-22 uh, uh, requires us to uh, follow this process in order to get the uh, SEP and Eagleston property, their request from the assessor for a lower taxation value. This has been a little bit of a a push um, time-wise because the state statutes also say that um, any property that's been added to the historic, the state historic registry is enabled for their special tax val uh, valuation, but it needs to be done so by uh, December 31st of the year that they were given the, um, given the certification by the, or by, since, since the date that they were put on the registry, the state registry in that same year. So that's, that's why this has moved um, a little quicker than these sorts of things normally do. And hopefully that gave you enough information to at least get you asking questions <laughs> because there's a lot here and uh, I'm happy to answer any additional questions. There's a lot of information in the packet and I recognize it's been a long night already and you've had a lot of lot on your agenda today. So I'm happy to answer any questions. And then uh, if there's anything specific to the property that you have questions about, um, we can uh, point that to the SAPs. Um, I think you all recognize that the, the property, uh, sorry, not the SAP, but Mr. Sapp and Ms. Eagleson, I apologize. Um, and then I think we all recognize that 804 Ferry Street is the former Cedar Rulli Hospital, and that was its historical significance. Um, as you can see, 
in the notification <clears throat> that it has been added to the state registry. It's referred to as the Dr. James and Margaret Mills House um, on the Washington State Historic Registry. So that's my spiel. If you've got any questions, well, let's just, have them. Just, just one, from a point of procedure, you have three separate motions here. There are three separate yes. motions, so we would do three separate motions, three separate... And under what jurisdiction? Under Planning Commission or, or the Historic uh, Preservation Committee? <laughs> Who are we acting as in this particular capacity? You're, you're, you're acting as the Historic Preservation Committee right. uh, Commission. Mm -hmm. However, you know, we have clearly stated that the Planning Commission is the Historic okay. Preservation Commission. So it, I, I haven't... Uh, haven't seen any reason to clear, make a clear demarcation. Okay. That's why we're running this on the uh, Cedaroli Planning Commission agenda. And I didn't create a separate agenda in a separate meeting because the Planning Commission is designated as that commission. Okay, thank you. Very similar to when we did the shoreline assessment. I think we were technically switching hats there as well. As a I think that one we actually created a separate agenda and everything. But, it, but similar, yes. So just, just one comment on, on historic districts in general. When you define a property as a historic site, any future owner now is pretty much bound to totally independent people that tell them what they can and can't do with their home. And it's a double-edged sword. I, I get it. No, I'm, just, I'm just saying, because I see it in the real estate business, that's what I do. A lot of people stay away from the historic homes because they don't want to be bound by some, you know, committee in a, in a, in a, in a, in a community. And I, it's just, I'm just throwing it out there. Not anything to do with this. May I address that? Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, I am Jean Eagleston. I'm with Terry Sapp, the co-owner of 804 Ferry Street. Uh, the Washington State Heritage Registry does not make those uh, commitments. It doesn't require that you have it open to the public unless it cannot be viewed from the street. Mm -hmm. We could tear our house down. We're not going to. We love this house. We believe it's a very important part of the history of Cedar Woolley, but the state registry doesn't limit the uses or modifications. The language that's used for what's being discussed here for the city of Cedar Woolley would have a process by which people would have to go to the city commission in order to make changes, additions, and I don't imagine the city would allow you to paint an historic house fluorescent pink, for example. But I was surprised as I started this process with the state heritage registry that there were not those kinds of strict limitations on what you could do with the property. No, I hear you, but in this particular case, the city would be putting an ordinance in place that absolutely not only monitors but manages and effectively oversees the cans and cans to a particular property. That that's all I'm bringing up. Right. I, th I think it's important to point out that the the uh, what properties that are added to the actual register mm -hmm. need that they, they'll be applying to the city to be. Uh, given that designation, that right. it's not something that it just starts going out and saying we want this one on the register, right. despite the property owner's wishes. Right, and I think it's also possible to uh, choose to have your house removed from the registry. Mm -hmm. That you could appeal to the city to be removed, and a new owner, for example, might choose to do that. And um, if I remember correctly from, from when I read the packet, the tax 
designation is for a period, right? It's only for like a 10 year period. Um, so at the end of that 10 years, even though you're, you're still on the registry, does it then have to continuously be re-upped and re-reviewed by the commission for just strictly for the tax um, valuation purposes, not necessarily for like being actually on the registry per se? My reading of the RCW is that that is not specifically addressed. What would have to happen, however, is that the homeowner or property owner would have to make additional improvements that are appropriate in terms of restoration. And it has to be done in a 24 month period. And then you perhaps could submit again to the Skagit County Assessor's Office this uh, form that is the, oh gosh, it has a really long name. It is the application and certification of special valuation in improvements to historic property. It's a Department of Revenue form, which is submitted to the assessor. The assessor then notifies, in this case, uh, Dave Thomas notified the county commissioners and the city of Cedar Woolley for a local review board to review that application. What he heard back from both the commissioners and the city of Cedar Woolley, there is no such thing. County commissioners don't have one. The city didn't have one. In fact, he told me that the, I think he's been in the, his office for 25 years. He has never known of anybody else other than us who have tried to do this. Mm. And so the Cedar Woolley is really in first place. I don't know, is there a race here, Mr. Coleman, uh, <laughs> to get this done? Um, uh, but it is the first time I believe that it's been done. So I don't think anybody here today knows whether or not that 10 year period could somehow be extended but it would have to be done very cleverly um, I would think and maybe not at all but if it's even possible you'd have to put more money into restoration efforts 24 month period apply and go through all of these steps it is a multi-step process and and one thing I'd like to explain about why we're doing this it does feel like a football game and I use this analogy at the uh, city council meeting also I don't know it's two minutes left or a minute left in the game and maybe we're on the five yard line but would really like to get across that goal line and it has to be done by December 31st mm -hmm. in the same year when you make the application to your county assessor well you can't do that until your property is on the heritage registry. The body that meets to make those decisions only meets three times a year. Usually they meet in June, but this year they didn't meet until towards the end of July, July 22nd. So we weren't notified in writing, I needed that certificate to send to Dave Thomas. We didn't know officially until the beginning of August. And so that's why things have um, been pushed onto such a short time. So, so you've started the application process. You're already, you're already there on certain uh, determinations and notices that you've received. Well, I started the application process in terms of my research in, um, the, let's say, November, I think, of uh, 2019. Wow. We purchased the uh, house. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me, I, I misspoke. We purchased the house on May 28th, 2019. We received a building permit from the city on December 4th, 2019. We had a goal to keep as much as possible of all of the original elements in the house. The house was in very poor condition. It had not been well maintained, but it had really good bones and it had some absolutely elegant, um, beautiful craftsmanship. Features. And it wasn't too long after we purchased the house that we learned it had been a hospital. Lots of people know that. One of uh, your classmates, Cedar Woolley classmates, Glenn Allen, city council member, <laughs> says he's pretty sure his dad was born in Valley Hospital, as hmm. it was known from 1916 to 1929. 
And for all but two of those years, 1918 to 1929, it was the only hospital in the eastern part of Skagit County. And it served people all the way up Concrete Marble Mount, all the way up river. It closed in 1929 as a hospital because Memorial Hospital, the first large public hospital, was open then. And this tradition of physicians having hospitals in their homes ended pretty much at that point in Skagit County. So I started, after we moved into the house, the restoration was done during the pandemic. That was interesting. Um, and chat had its challenges. And Terry and I functioned as the general contractors on the job. Um, so our efforts, my, certainly mine at that time, didn't include doing the research on the house. But once we moved in, I started more investigations, started with the Cedro Woolley Museum, and I submitted the first draft of the application to the Heritage Registry in March of 2022, and then the second draft a month later. And that was the first round for 2022. And so then they met on July 22nd to approve it. Um, after we heard from the Skagit County Assessor that there was no local review board in the county or in the city of Cedar Woolley, uh, in October we wrote to Mayor Johnson describing our situation. She was familiar with the house because the day the building inspector came to give us our occupancy permit, he brought her with him. Tony Nixon brought Julia Johnson, Mayor Johnson, uh, to the house. And so she saw it in its unfurnished, almost finished um, state and was aware of the history of the house as, as well as seeing it in its uh, remodeled uh, condition. We went to the November 22nd City Council meeting with our plea. <clears throat> Is there any way this can possibly be done by the end of the year? And uh, as you know, then they came back and passed an, an ordinance on December 14th. So you're I, I guess it has been handed to you to be essentially this local review board is what the RCW refers to throughout its language as the entity that will approve that application with the really long name that went to the county assessor. And it is on pages in the material that you received. That's on pages, I think it's 20 to 22 uh, is the text that accompanied the DOR form. And it includes a description of the rehabilitation, the specific, specific tasks that were done. And it's everything from rewiring the whole house and, and all of the original lighting fixtures that were there, having those rewired so they're in use. Uh, repairing lots of lap and plaster that was in poor condition. The entire interior and exterior of the house, those were painted. We had to replace all of the plumbing in the kitchen and in both bathrooms. And those were modernized. We work with Mark Christ, who's a local architect. Uh, he did the design for the kitchen and the bathrooms. We put in a new boiler and we use the original radiators. And it's fabulous heat and some of the radiators are just gorgeous pieces of um, heritage equipment, historic equipment. Um, the floors in the house are a marvel. Uh, the first floor has one inch maple, two inch maple, two inch maple, two inch maple that's laid continuously in this really elaborate pattern on all of the first floor, except, except one room. And we're pretty sure that was the operating room because we have the original fuse box. And, and when we purchased the house, there was still some knob and tube wiring in the house. And our insurance agent had said, uh, excuse me, but you know, you, you can't have that. And the electrician who worked on the house primarily said the rest of the wiring 
was scary, <laughs> truly scary. Home, homegrown versions, he thought, probably. But this original <coughs> electrical panel is there, and the fuses are labeled. And operating room is mentioned, and this one room on the main floor had fur flooring. Everything else is this gorgeous maple, fur flooring. Three holes down to the basement. Drain holes, <laughs> probably, we guess. That's Carrie's office now. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, the, we kept all of the single pane <clears throat> windows, except those on the north side of the house where the kitchen remodeling took place. And there were a lot of broken windows and the uh, leaded windows are actually, we've been educated as zinc. Uh, they were so loose that they would shake when you closed the front door, so all of that was reglazed. We had a, a tremendous group of craftsmen, they were all men, who worked on the house who just had tremendous skills and they turned what had been um, a house in very poor repair into a really lovely dwelling. And we're we thought from the beginning that the dwelling deserved to be restored. It really deserved it. It had this great history, and the more I learned about the history of Dr. Mills, who's quite a character, if you read that far through your whole long uh, app, the, the packet you got, it includes our application to the State Heritage Registry. So there is a section of that that talks about Dr. Mills and his life story, which is very colorful. Um, <laughs> But its feature in the community as a hospital is what really uh, anchors its historic value, along with the fact that it is an excellent example of craftsman architecture. Um, it has some semi-unique features in terms of the windows in the house and, and some other small details. So we are um, here tonight hoping that the motions, Mr. Coleman's um, memo is thorough and, and addresses the issues that uh, you all get to discuss and face tonight. Bottom line, we are so grateful. We really appreciate the time and effort that has been um, happened from Mayor Johnson, the City Council, uh, Mr. Charlie Bush, Mr. Coleman and his staff. We feel like they've moved a mountain in a very short amount of time. We are that five yard line place on the uh, football analogy and so with that if you have any other questions I'm happy to answer them. If you want to know the specifics of the construction that was done, Terry will answer those questions um, because he was the on-site. Yeah, I don't think that's necessary. You have done such an amazing job here. I've done my share of remodels over the years, mm -hmm. but I had a similar property back east that uh, I'm surprised the cold didn't start to shake when I saw mullions in here. <laughs> <laughs> We just did a whole bunch of work here in our downtown business in our central business district, and that came up on a thing, and it just got, it just got silly. No, I don't want to talk. About <laughs> yeah, I know. That, that surprised you weren't like, oh my god, zinc millions. Oh. But yeah, no, doing remodels like this to properties like that, it, it, it's it's a commitment. And I guess our job here tonight is to evaluate what everybody did, and there was just so much work that was done, and to get your folks across the uh, finish line. So, anybody have anything else to uh, add into this? Well, uh, to carry, piggyback off your football analogy, I, I hope that we hand the ball off and we don't yeah. pass it if if you get my uh, Super Bowl drift. Yeah, no, 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 no. Um, you got beast mode <laughs> running over the goal line. You don't throw it. Um, no, I, I know this property. I, I, I actually still distinctly remember driving by there as a kid and my mom telling me, oh, that's the old hospital. And I said, what? That That's a house. <coughs> and it just kind of boggled my mind that, at one point, houses were used as hospitals, and and you guys have, um, I haven't been to 
your pl I've driven only driven ever by it, but from the pictures that you guys provided um, and the amount of work that you obviously did, I mean, it it's quite a remodel, and you've really breathed life back into a very very beautiful home. I love I love Craftsman Homes. Um, them unto themselves are the the real Craftsman Homes are are of a historic value in, in my mind. Um, and you know, to me that this you know this makes a lot of sense. I do a lot of um, in my line of work. I do help a lot of people with ag and timber and forest land. Continue to continue on with open space um, tax designations. And so this, in my mind, is very analogous to that, where uh, it's the government, society, community recognizing the value that a certain piece of property has in its character, in this case, in its historic character, and that has value unto itself. And with the amount of uh, funds and labor that you've invested into it to maintain that value and that, um, that historic importance to the community, you know, is a way to earn that, that tax credit back, very similar to preserving egg, you know, where we, we want to preserve egg, and so the government encourages it by having open space tax evaluations and, and whatnot. And, but you have to, there's give and take, right? You can't just like get the designation and just run with this, you know, lower valuation, but you guys have clearly put that, that money into it. Um, so, actually, so it makes a lot of sense in my mind. Um, and I would comment that the uh, dollar amount that you see, uh, the requirement is that you spend at least 25% of the original market value in a 24 month period prior to the time that you make the application to be, uh, submit that to the county assessor. If it had been a 36 month period, that number would be much greater because a lot of our expenses started in 2019 and into the first part of 2020. And so we had, um, it, it's a much, greater expenditure than what you see, what we spent met that 24 month period requirement, but our um, expenditures are actually quite a lot greater. Market value is tough because it's a moving target period. When I had interest rates at two and a half percent, a heck lot different two years ago than it is today at six and a half percent. So anyway, anyone else? Hey John, I can combine this into one motion. Well, we can get the three separate entities here. It's easy to bring this all together as one instead of three separate ones. What are your thoughts on that? I'd say for simplicity's sake, let's let's keep it as the three. They're already written out for you to, it'll just take a moment each to do. Um, okay. I would That's also fine. like the, the commission to, um, you know, note that this house at least belongs on the, um, the historic, uh, um, the, the historic inventory before we move on, move it on from the historic inventory to the historic registry. Okay, so that would be a fourth motion. Uh, sure. Okay, can you give us the I don't know that it that? Needs to be that formal, but if you wanted to go down that road, that, 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 that would not be a bad thing. I want to keep it within the structure you have right now. What would that be? What would the language be? Um, I can make a motion uh, to add 804 Ferry Street, uh, the Dr. James and Margaret Mills house to the Cedra Woolley Register of Historic Places. Do I have this? John, that's what, John, that's what we're looking for, right? Well, we were looking to the, for the, we also have a designation. Uh, first, we need to designate it to the, uh, um, to, to the in historic inventory before we add it to the registry. So um, maybe we should vote on that previous motion to table it or, or put it down for now. Okay, so that's the Cedro okay. Woolley oh, Historic Registry? Motion. Or amend it. Uh, okay, it, how about I amend that motion to add it to uh, the inventory of historic places? Yes, thank you. Okay. 
Okay, is there a second on that motion? I'll second that. Okay, so we have a second by Commissioner Freiberger. Any further discussion? We'll take that as a no, so we will go to a vote. Commissioner Freiberger. Aye. Motion number one. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Maddox. Aye. Commissioner Huggins. Pat. Yes, and I congratulate you on completing a beautiful job. Yeah, right on. And Commissioner Fatizi. Uh, I as well. So that's a 5-2-0. Motion number one carries. So on to... And then the, the, ahead, the next motion would be to make a motion to add 804 Ferry Street, Dr. James and Margaret Mills House to the Cedar Valley Register of Historic Places. Okay, would somebody like oh, to really. repeat that? <laughs> I, would, I would like to add 804 Ferry Street, the Dr. James and Margaret Mills House as the first property to the Cedar Woolley Registry of Historic Places. Okay, is there a second? I'll second that. We have a second by Commissioner Maddox. Is there any further discussion on the motion? I assume the answer is no. Uh, so we will now take a vote. Commissioner Freiberger. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Maddox. Aye. Commissioner Huggins. Aye. Commissioner Fatizi, aye. Motion carries. 5-0. On to motion number three. And I think that's where we pick up on your list, John. The one in the uh, recommendation. So, no, yeah. Um, number five in bold there the, uh, on page four to make okay. a motion to enter into a historic preservation agreement with the applicants, Jean Eagles, Dan, and Terry Sapp. Uh, that is attached as attachment four to the memo. Okay, and that would be the second motion on this list. Okay, so would someone like to make a motion to enter into the Historic Preservation Special Valuation Agreement with Gene Eagleston? Uh, that's, no, that's the wrong one. It's the, the make a motion to enter into a Historic Preservation Agreement with the applicants, Gene Eagleston and Terry Sapp. Okay, would somebody like to... I will make a motion to enter into a historic preservation agreement with the applicants, Gene Eagleston and Terry Stapp, uh, attachment number four of our memo okay, that we're working on. Is there a second on that motion? Second. I have a, I have a yeah. motion by Commissioner Maddox and a motion and a second by Commissioner Johnson. Is there any further discussion? Guess the answer is no. On to the vote. Commissioner Freiberger. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Maddox. Aye. Commissioner Huggins. Aye. Commissioner Fatizi. Aye. Motion carries 5 0. On to our next motion. Which one would you like me to start with, John? So that is number six on page four of the memo. To make a motion to approve and sign the certification of approval for special valuation on historic property for 804 Ferry Street, which is attachment five of your memo. And it's on your third third motion to work to, on the recommendation. Okay. Would somebody like to make a motion to approve and sign the certification of approval for special valuation on historical property for 804 Ferry Street? I so move. Do I have a, I didn't make the motion, I was, okay, that's, so that's a first by Commissioner Freiberger. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay, we have a second from Commissioner Maddox. Any further discussion? Assuming that's no, so on to the vote. Uh, Commissioner Freiberger. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Maddox. Aye. Commissioner Huggins. Aye. Commissioner Fatizi. Aye. Motion carries, passes, five, nothing. What else do we have left, ladies and gentlemen? So that concludes the, um, the, the portion of the evening with the okay. Historic Preservation Commission. And so now we can move on to 
uh, planning commission uh, discussion and information items. And there's one thing on the uh, agenda there. Okay, and that would be for a new planning commissioner appointment. So, John, take it so off. Do we have an applicant? Like it. I'd like to uh, acknowledge that the mayor uh, uh, recommended appointment and the planning and the uh, city council appointed um, Mr. Paul Koch, I believe is how he pronounces his name. It's C O C K E. Um, he uh, will be uh, on the planning commission starting January of 2023 for a six year term okay and that's congratulations <laughs> congratulations to him i don't i don't see him in the audience today um otherwise we could give him a round of applause <laughs> what what's some of mr coke's background do you know um i do it's actually in the last city council agenda packet is his is his letter i don't have it in front of me mm -hmm. If you're interested, uh, his his letter of interest is included on the consent agenda of the December 14th City Council meeting, um, and I suppose I could email that out to you at some point. I just don't have it in front of me. I'm no sorry. Deal. Just a question. Sounded like you had some planning background, actually. That'd be great. Yeah. So at this time, is there anything uh, good for the order? Anybody wants to go through besides uh, happy holidays to everybody from me and uh, looking forward to an awesome 2023? I, I want to congratulate um, you guys on a historic moment being added to as the first property to the historic registry and being, I guess, the first in Skagit County to to do this, so I guess we're we're all kind of part of a bit of a piece of history there unto itself. So first place <laughs> history, history upon history. So congratulations on that, and very happy for you guys. And uh, and back at you, you did a historic thing right now. You're, you're right. welcome. You earned it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And speaking for myself, if there is a, any point going forward with this, what will be a committee that gets, a commission that gets formed uh, in 2023, if there's ever a role for, you know, a volunteer who can, who has some skills, um, I am certainly now very interested <laughs> in this. Yeah, make process. that offer because it's important to have people with background, especially on a project like this. You dealt with the, the millions of the world. <laughs> I'm interested. <laughs> and I have a really good relationship with uh, Michael Hauser, who's the state architectural historian. Awesome. He's the person to whom at DAHP, -A uh, where these applications for state registry are submitted. We had many phone conversations and lots of editing back and forth of the draft of our application to the state heritage registry. He's a very uh, helpful professional. Fantastic. Anyone else? Okay, with that, meeting is adjourned, 8.47 p.m., and thank you and happy holidays, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry awesome Christmas. job, John and Nicole. Good night, Thank you. Did you have to formally vote on the adjournment? Oh, yeah, no, that, that, I'm sorry. Uh, would anyone like to make a motion to adjourn?